Good evening. Good evening. We're going to go through, uh, finish the uh, first half of 24. As we follow the exploits and the ups and the downs and the adventures and the disappointments of David and Saul, you'll remember at the end of chapter 23, David was just a step away from death with his men on one side of the hill and Saul's men on the other. And the Lord saved him in the nick of time by word of the Philistine invasion getting to Saul, and he had to stop what he was doing, chasing David, and uh, go after uh, the Philistines, which was a much more pressing problem than David was at the time. And as uh, after Saul returns from the uh, engagement with the Philistines, uh, chasing David near in Gedi, down here, yeah, right here, right on the Dead Sea. You remember Saul has to take care of a problem, goes to the cave and relieves himself, and turns out that David and his men were at the back of the cave, and they sneak up where Saul laid his uh, roll beside him. David clips the corner of the road and then later has a, a guilty conscience about <clears throat> what he did. Saul leaves the cave and David calls after him and pleads his case, not for the first time, but another time, pleads his case to Saul that he was being treated unjustly, that he was no threat, had never done anything negative to Saul. We're down in the chapter 24, around verse 9 and on down. And uh, in verses 12 through 15, David attempts to convince Saul of the injustice that's being done him by warning him in verse 12 that God's judgment is coming. <clears throat> and if David had been the enemy Saul took him for, David would have killed Saul then and there. And David says, I didn't do it. I didn't touch you. I've never touched you, and I've never even threatened you. And uh, verse 14 is interesting because, uh, let's see, 25, 24, 14, I'm sorry. And after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea? What's his point there? I'm no threat. I'm no threat at all. I'm just a flea. I couldn't hurt you if I wanted to. He said, I'm not a you. You need to leave me alone. Take up, John. It's not really. <clears throat> if he wanted to, David had obviously demonstrated he could. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was not going to. He presented no danger. Right. Although he could. Yes. Uh, so he says, uh, it's the same as if he were chasing a, a single flea or a dead dog. Uh, there's just no point in uh, all of this. And then in the, the last part of the verse, he calls upon the Lord to make the decision between him and Saul. And Saul once again does what in verses 16 through the end of the chapter? <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry for what I've done. You're right. I'm wrong. You're going to be king. We've heard all this before. <clears throat> and does David buy it? No, he does not. Because if you look at verse 22... Saul goes back to Gibeah. Now remember, Gibeah is the royal headquarters now. It's where Saul lives. Saul lives. <clears throat> and David goes back to the stronghold somewhere near probably in Gideon. And so David knew Saul well enough that I've, I've seen this before and heard all of this before. And he'll tell me that he's agreeing with me and how bad a guy he is and he won't harm me. But I know better, and for that reason, David goes back to the stronghold instead of going with Saul back to the capital city, if you want to call it that, of Gibeah, which is right here north of Jerusalem, just a few miles north of Jerusalem. And anytime Saul goes back to his home, that's where he goes. Okay, chapter 25. David. Now here in Gedi, he goes over to a place or is in the 
the area called Mayon, M-A-O-N. At least if you've got the NIV, that's what it has. Mine has the wilderness of Paran, which is way down in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. So uh, the sources are not sure exactly where David is, whether he took a, a long trip south for supplies or whatever, I don't know. And then he comes back up, and I'm trying to find M-A-O-N here. Right here, down here. Right next, probably two miles from Carmel. Carmel is the hometown of a gentleman by the name of Nabal. And David gets word <clears throat> that there's a sheep sharing event taking place. And you have to keep this in mind throughout all of these incidents. David's got how many men to support? Two hundred someone. How many how many fighting men does David carry with him? 600, <clears throat> and that doesn't include their families. So David's the one responsible for the upkeep, the feeding of 600 plus people. And he doesn't have a farm, so he depends upon the people who are in sympathy with him. And uh, usually that means wealthy landowners and people who have sided with him rather than Saul or the uh, Philistines. <clears throat> now, David had made it a habit of protecting Judah's people, Israel's people down in the south, from raiders such as the Amalekites, raiders such as the Philistines, <coughs> who would come in at uh, harvest season and just take what they wanted. Because they wanted the food too, and David was a fence, if you please, or a wall between the settlers, the people who lived down here in this southern part of Judah, and these kind of raiders. So, because of David's protection of them, many citizens and property, property owners gladly supported David and his men because it was the same as having a 600-man army to keep your town from being raided. So, he's down there in that area, and he hears about an annual event called the Sheep Shearing, and it was also the occasion of a festival. The man's owner, of the, the owner of the sheep was a man by the name of Nabal. Verse 2 and 3 describe wealthy, uh, Nabal is wealthy, harsh, and an evil man. <clears throat> so, when he hears that Nabal is having this annual event celebrated with a feast. He says, you know, this is a pretty good time for me to get some supplies for my men. Billy. Nabal is Hebrew. Fool. Nabal means fool in Hebrew. No, I'm sorry, I didn't bring that up. If ever a shoe fit, I guess that's it. Uh, anyway, David sent a, a friendly, complimentary delegation to Nabal. Uh, greeted him cordially and uh, told Nabal by means of these messengers that by the way I have been protecting your sheep out here in the wilderness from raiders and all of your property has been under my guardianship un you know, unofficially uh, and if you wanted to he could uh, verify this fact by asking his own workers. Now that being the case, he says, I need, would like for you to give me a few supplies for my men who have been providing this great service for you. <clears throat> so Nabal said, oh, I appreciate that. I'm going to send you all you want. No, he insulted David's messengers and David himself. Said, David, you're a rebel from your master Saul. <clears throat> and he gave them nothing in return turned and they came back and told David how Nabal had treated them and him. <clears throat> David didn't like that. So he mobilizes 400 out of the 600 men and immediately starts a march toward who? Nabal. <clears throat> David didn't appreciate the way he was treated. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Abigail, Nabal's wonderful wife, heard what had happened from one of 
Nabal's servants. And she was a smart lady. <clears throat> she said, this is trouble. She probably, everybody down there, I'm sure, knew of David and knew the resources he had at hand. And you insult a man like that, you're asking for trouble. So they told her what happened, <clears throat> and they told her why David's request for food should have been granted in the first place, and Nabal should never have treated him like that, and that Nabal, uh, David's men had indeed protected them from raiders all along. <clears throat> Abigail assessed the situation and immediately took action. She got some provisions, loaded them on donkeys, and sent a... Uh, a few gifts with some servants ahead to David. And what was David doing at the time? <clears throat> he was on his way to Nabal, marching with his 600 men. She didn't tell Nabal what she was doing. That's in verse 19. <clears throat> she approached David with a completely different attitude than Nabal had. She was humble and courageous. And asked David in verse 24 to place the blame where? Blame me. Blame me. She acknowledged that her husband was indeed a harsh fool. And said, you know, I didn't see or hear any of this until just recently. I didn't know anything about the men that you had sent Nabal. She says she's come on behalf of the Lord to keep David from being guilty of vengeance and bloodshed. There was no need for that. They didn't want the future king to be guilty. <clears throat> she gave David the supplies, asked him to forgive her. Now, what a gracious woman this really was. I'm the one to blame. Here's the supplies. Please forgive. Does it remind you of somebody? Please forgive me. Don't blame Lloyd for the sins he's committed. Jesus said you can put the blame on you can put the blame on me. Yeah. <clears throat> Abigail knew David was going to be king and didn't want him to com uh, commit an evil like that. And that the Lord in verse 29 would protect David. And Abigail asked David to consider how much better it would be when he became God's appointed leader not to have this on his record and on his conscience. <clears throat> and verse 31 is cute. Oh, by the way, when you do become king, don't forget me. Don't forget me. David thanked Abigail and said how much he appreciated what she had done for her good advice. Somebody have something over here? Okay. Uh, he accepted the supplies and sent Abigail home in peace and granted her request. Now, Abigail wanted to tell Nabal, I'm sure what had happened, but he was too what to listen. He was too drunk. So I had to wait until the next morning until the man sobered up. And when he found out from Abigail what had happened, the Bible says in verse 37, uh, verse, uh, yeah, 37, he suffered a stroke and was paralyzed. Now, I don't know whether it was because, boy, that was a close call, she saved my life, or because that sure wasn't expensive to send all those supplies to David. Because you get the feeling that he was a little bit greedy. She sent him how many sheep? Two sheep. Don't tell me how many. I think there was a figure about how many sheep. 3,000 and she sent him two sheep and he fainted. Tells you what kind, another indication of what kind of man this fellow really was. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, I think Abigail sent him two sheep and some rice and cakes and a few other things to help his men. Verse 38 tells us that God didn't like the way that Nabal uh, conducted himself either in that. Nabal brought, uh, God brought judgment on Nabal and he died 10 days later and David was thankful to the Lord that he had vindicated him and his cause and that he did not commit the, the murder himself in verse 39. <clears throat> so, now, David has got his men fed, 
She's got the problem solved. She's got two women already. How many wives was the king supposed to have? One wife. One wife. He's already got two. A Hemlo and uh, <coughs> sir. <coughs> yep. Uh, David gets to thinking that night of what a wonderful woman she was and decides he wants her as his wife. <clears throat> well, yes, that didn't hurt. Uh, You don't, you don't know her. smart and good looking too. So. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. So David sends his servants in verse 39 with a marriage proposal to Abigail, and she says yes right off the bat. Now, I had a question to myself and didn't know exactly the answer. <clears throat> David takes Abigail as his third wife. Does David now own all of Nabal's property and land? Or does that stay in her family? If he owns it, he would probably own it until the year of Jubilee, and then it would back to the family. Okay. Okay. I was not sure about that. We know that's the year of Okay, so David became a quite a uh, wealthy man. Well, she would have owned it. She would have owned it. Yes. And but now she owns her. Yes. Her yes. And she says, I'm your humble maidservant, if I remember correctly. So whatever she had, I'm sure David uh, had too. This man eat better. Sir? This man eat better after this. This man eat better after this. That's a good, a good way to put it, John. He also says here yeah. that Saul, didn't Saul gave the first, his first wife? Michael. He promised. He gave away. The, the last verse is here. It says that he says, given Michael away to Yes. Yeah. Uh, Took her away and gave away. Yeah. And is it we, we don't, listen, we don't know why that happened. It could have been Saul says, David's as good as dead. I'm going to give my daughter to someone else. Uh, it could have been when David had to finally flee to the Kibbeah when he realized that Saul was after him. Yes, helped him escape. Helped him escape from Gabea. But we weren't told that at the time of the war, did she? Yeah. No, 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 no. That she was given away. No, 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 no. This is the first time we learn about that. We don't, we don't hear anything more about Michael until right here. Uh, it could have been said, you know, David's never home. David's never home. And she just got tired of it. And divorce me. We don't know. We don't know. He will take her back later. He'll forcibly, yeah, he will forcibly take her back. In chapter, I think it's 31 3. Somebody check me on that. Or, uh, it's a couple of chapters ahead. <coughs> yeah. I don't want to get bogged down in details on this survey, but, survey, but that lady, you know, in verse. 25, uh, chapter, uh, verse 43, we need to know about her. The only other time that she, this name is mentioned in the Bible, is a woman who in chapter 14 and verse 50 is none other than the wife of King Saul. What? Chapter 14, verse 50. Now, we don't know whether it's the same woman or not, but it sure is an odd coincidence to me that David has married a woman who had the same name as Saul's, one of Saul's wives. We don't know, but it sure struck me as odd. Can David marry a woman who's got a spring with her? And, and what? Can David marry one of his wives who's got a spring given to him? Spring of water. Okay, you, you may be right. I don't know. If it wasn't him, it was one of the leaders. Okay. If it wasn't God, do you give it? I remember it. I think I do not remember for sure who. No, I don't either. I confess. Okay, chapter 26. 
David again spares Saul's life. Now, the people from Ziph told right here, down below, right below Hebron, not far from Carmel, where he's just been hanging around, told Saul where David was. Now remember, we've already had one town betray David. You remember the reason? It's probably the same reasons. If you got a Saul with a many, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 man army and David was 600, generally if you're going to side with somebody and offend the other side, a lot of people will say, I'm going to side with Saul against David. So a lot of people were just torn in their loyalties. But Ziph, the people there, decided that they were going to side with King Saul. And when Saul found out what was going on, he started out, took the 3,000 men to a place called Hakila, which is in the same area down there. Um, and David, David is hidden somewhere in the desert. And his scouts learned where Saul is camped in his pursuit of David. Now, knowing where Saul is camped, David <coughs> decides to do a little raiding himself. David sneaked up on Saul's camp, noticed where Saul and Abner were sleeping. Now, who's Abner? The devil, one of Saul, Saul's military commander, right-hand man, militarily speaking. So, David and his nephew, Abishai, volunteered, and they went in there and snuck right up where Saul and Abner and all the rest of the men were sound asleep. And Abishai wanted to kill Saul, and David said, what? You go ahead and kill him so I won't be guilty? No, don't lay your hands on God's anointing. David is consistent through all of this. Neither he nor anybody else that's under his command is going to lay a finger on Saul. He's just not going to permit it. So David told him no. <clears throat> and uh, right beside Saul was his spear and his uh, water jug, verse 12. So David and Abishai take both of those right from where beside Saul was sleeping. Without anybody being detected, because verse 12 says that the Lord sent a deep sleep on them to guarantee that nobody called them. And they crossed over to the other side to a hill and then turned around and yelled back at Abner and Saul. And David challenged Abner's position. He challenged his manhood and said, you are guilty of neglect and here's proof. Here's your king's water jug and uh, it's proof that you failed to protect your king. And his spear, by the way. <clears throat> Saul then finally woke up and recognized it was David and does what again? Mm -hmm. Same story, just slightly different words. <clears throat> My son, sorry again for all that he had done. And David in verse, uh, let's see, 18 and 19 makes another case for reconciliation with Saul. Uh, he says in verse 19, if others had turned Saul against him, they deserved to be cursed because they were trying to keep David from his inheritance. What does he mean there? If, if Saul could... He couldn't go home. He would lose his land inheritance in Israel if Saul got his way. And he says, you would force me to serve other gods, which was a, a way of saying, force me to live in a foreign land. And there, in the, in the course of the saying, was force me to worship a foreign or false god. Verse 19. <clears throat> so David pleaded in verse 20 with Saul not to let him die in exile in a foreign land and consider the true facts that he had done nothing more to Saul than a flea this time and instead of a dog a partridge. Again, I'm no threat. We've had these conversations before, haven't we? 
we've had these similar conversations before, and every time Saul's repentance lasts how long? Maybe a day? Yeah. The next day, no. Yeah, yeah. Just a long enough for David to get out of there. And David knows it. <clears throat> Saul confesses in verse 25, uh, 21 through 25. He asked David to come back to Gibeah with him. And uh, David says, by the way, in verse 23 and 24, there's a law we call the law of sowing and reaping, and it's going to come back on, on you, Saul. <clears throat> Anyway, verse 25, Paul, Saul speaks the last words he will ever speak to David. Blessed are you, my son David. You will both accomplish much and surely shall surely prevail. So Saul went on his way back on the run, and David went to his, excuse me, Saul went to his place. Now, where's his place? Could be a could be a G I B E A H right above Jerusalem again. That's his headquarters. <clears throat> That's the last time, as far as we know, that they ever talked to each other. The last time. Chapter 27. David sees that Saul is not going to give up. He's going to chase him and chase him and chase him until eventually, I guess, David thinks that. Sooner or later, Saul's going to get me, and I have got to get out of Judah. So, if you want to be absolutely sure that you're protected from King Saul, where's a great group of people to go to? The Philistines, for goodness sakes. The arch enemy of God's people. One of the arch enemies. The most arch of all of them. <clears throat> now, that tells you how desperate and tired and frustrated David was with this situation to do something like that. The enemy is my enemy is my friend. Yes, yeah, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, okay? You know, <clears throat> uh, a lot of this may have been for the safety of his men and women. Sure, that's exactly what it was for. Because <clears throat> David is a warrior, and his men were, were warriors. But probably, I mean, he says one of these days, I'm going to fall. Kind of what it, you know, there was, they had meat, they had 
met there and agreed that we won't cross this line. And that set the midst of stone set up and said, may God watch over us when we're apart. But it, it certainly helped the idea of watch our backs. Watch our backs, yeah. Well, there's a Exactly, I think that's probably what happened. That's probably what happened. Now the Philistines would be thrilled to have a military leader like John said, uh, Billy said, like David had 600 men with him fighting on my side. Oh yeah. More, more importantly, not against them. Yes. That's really to keep your friends close. Your enemies even closer. <laughs> Know yeah. exactly where they are, exactly what he's doing with it. They're not attacking you. You give them a the job to go take care of that problem over there. I mean, that, how many Philistines did he kill and for Micah, for that for his wife? Four hundred. Yeah, how many? Right. I mean, let's go through all that. He has killed the thousands. And, I mean, look at the Saul. Saul killed his thousands, and David killed his ten thousands. Okay. I mean. Yeah. And the Philistines knew that song. They knew that kind of Every mean, verse. They knew that kind of mean. Mean. That probably what didn't hit the top ten in Felicity. Uh, I suspect they uh, felt like he's hard to beat, so it's better to keep him where we know he's yeah. kind of on our side. Oh yeah. Yeah, so there's there's good thinking on Akish's who's the king of the Felicity in Gal. Uh, thinking and accepting David and his six hundred men because that was his royal city and he could keep an eye on him. So actually I'm <clears throat> United States and Israel, it, it, there are good things to keep, keep close to you because you need to watch what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so David stays in Gad for a while, and then he finally decides that after a certain period of time, he doesn't want to live in the royal city anymore. He wants to live out in the country and ask Akish if we can go, if he and his men could go to uh, Ziklag, which is uh, I'm not sure. Down here in this, well, it's in Simeon's old territory, right in the middle of Judah. Now, all of you knew that, didn't you? Simeon's territory was carved out of Judah's territory, right in the middle. And it was where Ziklag was uh, located. And who controlled the city right in the middle of Simeon's and Judah's territory? The Philistines. It was a Philistine city. Philistines, yeah, they controlled a bunch of that area down there. That's why David was so valuable to the landowners and the cattle owners down there to keep the raiders down. Them and the Amalekites both. Uh, it's, uh, by the way, uh, Ziklag I've got here is 25 miles southwest of Gap where David had been. He spent, I think, about 14 or 16 months with the Philistines total. Uh, and of course, uh, Alkish was glad to have David down there to prevent raids on the Philistine border on that side of the country. It's good to have 600 men down there in that town to protect our flank down there. i tell you what, let's, let's wait for the Let's end right here and begin with uh, chapter 27, verse 8 next week because that is a classic, that is a classic example of uh, David's ingenuity and David's smarts and David's deceptive abilities. Any Lord. questions? Lloyd. Yes, Ed. I was in a field, a uh, point of embarkation in California, and they had a bunch of German prisoners out of the serving and they brought a bunch of Americans that had been in prison camp, and one of these Americans had a club in his hand, and he recognized the guard that had been over him. He went, he went over that counter, broke glasses and everything. About four or five pulled him off of them. He told them, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so 
sorry, I'm so sorry. They put him back in line. He went right back and cross, cross that town the second time after that German prisoner that had guarded him in a prison jail. Really? <laughs> That's a bad place for every minute that beat him in the middle of it. I'd say so. I'd say so. Anything else? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the lessons we can learn from, from your, the men of God and the difficulties they faced and take some lessons of how we can face the difficulties that life throws our way. We thank you so much for this record that we can study. Bless us all as we leave. In Jesus' holy name.